Welcome and good morning. And uh, <laughs> now I'm totally nervous that we're recording. <laughs> but anyway, it's very nice to see you all here in this very crisp, finally, uh, autumn has arrived. <laughs> and summer is gone as of day after day before yesterday. So. Uh, anyway, uh, this is my first opportunity, actually the first one I've taken to welcome you to this uh, presentation as a function of Fertile Groundworks, which is our new nonprofit organization for teaching organic gardening. And of course, the, uh, the uh, uh, things that the garden does for the community and that sort of thing are also very important. Uh, but uh, so, welcome uh, to the class again. I did want to uh, just give you a couple of pieces of information that uh, after the class you may want to, to take a uh, uh, share with us. I have a share card here that if uh, you shop at Lucky's, uh, you can show them. It's, it's kind of a, 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 a simple thing to do, but if you show them the sh share card uh, at the beginning, they'll scan it. And Fertile Groundworks will actually get 3% of the purchase oh. money. So I, I have a pile of them right here. It's, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'll pass them to me. Yes. Okay, I'll just pass it. Okay, yeah. and I think we have more if, if anyone yeah, wants to get others. The other thing is we have a little brochure here that tells you a little bit about the, the nonprofit. So I didn't want to take a lot of time, but if you would like a little bit more information about what some of our plans and programs uh, uh, are that uh, we, we have in the hopper here. Uh, feel free to talk to me or go on our website or anything else. But now I have the great pleasure of introducing Marion Yox Laddams, uh, a master gardener, Albany County master gardener, and a soil scientist, and a very uh, uh, experienced, uh, I, I guess I would say, professional market gardener and community gardener and a teacher. A yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a great word, yeah. So it's a great pleasure to, and you can. Thank Tell you. us a little more about your background yeah. if you like. But. Sure. Well, I can yeah, get going. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Um, so um, a little bit about my background is I was educated at UC Davis. Um, I have a bachelor's in soil science and agronomy. And then my um, I managed a soil ecology lab there for a while. So I was kind of in the scientific world. I worked on a bunch of farms. And then um, most recently, up until my daughter was born, I was the farm manager for Center for Land-Based Learning, which is in uh, Winters, California, outside of Davis. And I taught about soils and farming and all the things that you guys are interested in doing. So that's what I do. I teach about agriculture, and I love it. And it just it gets me really excited. <laughs> so um, I, hopefully, I can share that enthusiasm. And um, hopefully, you guys are will enjoy this lecture. Um, I guess, so question, how many of you guys are master gardeners? How many of you guys live in Livermore? Okay, how many of you guys live um, in the Tri-Valley area? Are any of you guys from over the hill, like Berkeley? Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll try to say some stuff that applies to you too. Okay. <laughs> um, so my presentation, I'm calling it dirt. We talked about calling it the dirt on dirt or something cute. But what, what it doesn't say there is soil. A lot of soil scientists um, really like it if you call it soil and not dirt because they think that that's a fancier name. But um, I personally like to call it dirt. It's only soil when it's in the ground, in place, with layers. We'll talk about that, but, but I think that dirt is a much friendlier term. All right, so let's get going. Let's look at the whole landscape. This is Google Earth. This is a Google Earth image, obviously, looking down on Livermore from the north, basically. Um, we are, this is Buena Vista right here, so we're roughly right. We're, we're kind of in this neighborhood over here um, right now. And what do you see here? What do you see in this image? What? Come again? Did I, did I hear mountains? Hills? Valley. Valley. Very good. Very good. Yeah. 
so, I mean, there's a lot of urban development in here, but essentially what you can see here is on the landscape scale, this shows you where our soil came from. It is um, basically what happens is these mountains up here, rain falls on them. They can't, the rock chemically weathers. It physically weathers, meaning it breaks apart into little pieces. And then when the floods used to come, what would happen is water would come down and fill up this valley. And it would be mucky water because it flowed down off the hills in big rainstorms. And it would be mucky water. And so if you can imagine yourself standing here um, 200 years ago during a big rain year, you can imagine that there would be mucky water everywhere. And what happens when that mucky water slows down, spreads out, drops its sediment load, and then evaporates is you have a little layer of sediment left here in the Livermore Valley. So that is the parent material of our soil. It's, that, it's, that, it's called alluvium, alluvial soil. That means sediment transported by water, and this whole valley is filled with alluvium. Okay. So, so this is a big, long definition of soil. Um, it's a lot of text. But basically what it says is that soil is a natural body composed of salt, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, basically what it says is that soil is formed in layers. Um, it, is, it undergoes changes. The, the minerals within soil undergo changes that turn it from just sediment into soil. It is able to support rooted plants. Um, the upper bound, and then the, the, this defines the upper and lower boundaries of soil. The upper limit of soil is the, between air or water, where, where the solids interface with air or water. And the lower boundary is um, basically, functionally defined as where there are fewer microorganisms um, and then it's arbitrarily set at 200 centimeters because nobody wants to dig a pit deeper than 200 <coughs> centimeters um, to look at to study the soil um, so here in this picture you can see how soil is formed in layers so you can imagine this soil is from Alaska this is a pit it shows the face you know, it shows, you call this the face, it shows a vertical hole, and you can kind of see, it's really hard to see in a projector image, um, but you can see how there's an organic layer on top, and then the color changes as you go down. Can everybody see that? Okay, good. Um, the soil's in Alaska, so it's gonna look really different than the soils here. But what you can see, what you can imagine, sort of the narrative that goes with this picture is the same as the narrative that went with that picture of the mountains. What happened is over thousands of years, um, sediment was brought down from the mountains and it layered up, layered, 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 layered on top of each other, lots of layers. And then what happened is, and plants grew in it, and plants dropped their organic matter on top. As that organic matter began to decompose, it, the, it made, um, there's CO2, there's carbon dioxide from the little critters exhaling. Rain falls on that carbon dioxide, makes carbonic acid when it mixes with the carbon dioxide. And then it percolates down into this mineral soil. And that carbonic acid weathers the mineral particles in the soil. And what happens is that they start to undergo chemical changes. And one of the things that happen is primary minerals, such as feldspars and little grains of sand, all those minerals start changing into secondary minerals and moving down in the profile. So, and they re-precipitate as clay. So what you see here is an increase in the clay content. First you have this O horizon, then you have an A horizon, which is the top where the clays have moved out, and then you have a place where the clays have re-precipitated. You can see that in soils of, of, that have undergone almost any differentiation. You start to see an increase in clay as you move down. Now, there's all kinds of other 
really amazing chemical changes that can happen. Um, but I'm not going to go into those very much right now because California soils and our local soils are really young and so you're just not likely to encounter hard pans or um, permafrost or any of the other things that are really interesting to soil scientists here in the Tri-Valley or in Berkeley. So we'll move on. So, soil forming factors. So that narrative that I'm talking about um, <coughs> is basically a narrative of the soil forming factors. Soil, soil formation is a, a, a function of parent material, climate, biology, topography, and time. This guy named Hans Jenny developed this uh, developed this theory at Jug Handle Ecological Staircase up in Mendocino County. Has, has anybody ever been to Jug Handle State Preserve? It's really cool, and it has the most amazing soils I've ever seen. Basically, what's, what what is there at Jug Handle are these wave cut terraces where the ocean came and carved off a place and then the continental, you know, the, the continent uplifted and you get a time series with this being the youngest, this being the second youngest, this, you know, and then getting older as it goes on, as it moves up, uh, you get a time series of different soils. And what's really cool is that on, I think the fourth, no, the, the third terrace, you have pygmy forests. And so this guy, Hans Jenny, and that's caused by the soil conditions there. And this guy, Hans Jenny, went and dug pits in each of these steps and sort of developed this theory about the soil forming factors. Um, so to talk in a little bit more detail, parent material, um, soil formed from granite is going to be different from soil formed on basaltic parent material. Um, to give you an example, um, I mean, it's hard to give an example if you haven't seen it, but you know, granite has a lot of quartz crystals in it, and quartz crystals are very resistant to weathering, and so granite parent material is always going to give you a <coughs> sandier soil until it's like really, really old, um, because that quartz is resistant to weathering. Whereas basalt has very little quartz in it, and and it also has minerals in it that have that tend to weather more and so basalt tends to weather to clay so it tends to be a more sticky clay soil that it, it develops into so that's how parent material can make a difference in how a soil develops um, climate desert soils develop different develop differently from high rainfall soils can somebody tell me what you would expect to see in a desert soil sand. yes yeah, sand or do you think it would be a thick, deep soil? No, no very yeah. yeah, so you have very little development of soil in the, in the desert, as opposed to a rainforest soil where you have a highly developed, very, very weathered soil. A lot of weathering has gone on in that rainforest soil. Um, biology. Forest soils are different from grassland soils. Typical grassland soils are called mollisols, and they have a lot of organic matter throughout the profile because of perennial grass roots and root turnover in perennial grasses. So every year the, the, the grasses you know, grow more roots, and those, those, that organic matter from the grasses um, is distributed throughout the profile, whereas Forest soils actually tend to drop more litter and have more organic matter right at the surface. Also, um, forest soils tend to be fungally dominated, whereas grassland soils tend to be um, tend to be uh, bacterially dominated, which also really changes the dynamics of how the soil forms. Um, Topography, soils formed in low-lying areas are different from high standing areas. A really great example of that is here in California in the Delta, um, that the Delta used to be flooded, and so what kind of soil do we have there? So. Peat. Yeah. It's an organic soil. River yeah, river bottom, because it used to be flooded, and that none of that organic matter had any oxygen getting to it, so it couldn't burn off, and so that soil, um, 
And so, so that was a completely organic soil. Whereas upland areas in the valley, they only have, you know, so, so the peat soils have 90 or 90% 90 or so organic matter. The upland areas in the valley tend to, in their natural state, have about 2% organic matter. And it's because they're aerated. And so all that organic matter just 